And this morning, we're going to continue looking at Mark's gospel. We've been doing this for the last six months as a church, would you believe? And we're going to look a little bit more at this now. Uh, Just introduction to myself. My name's Sanjay. I'm one of the leaders here at the church. And um, it is a real joy if you are new uh, or you've come to church on Easter thinking, I want to check this thing out. You're really, really welcome. Our mission together as a church is to love God to be family together, and to reach the world around us for Jesus. So this is us. If you're new, we want to reach you with the good news of Jesus. And um, the story so far is this. Jesus has turned up on the scene 2,000 years ago. He's gone around teaching the people God's standards and values. He's displayed God's compassion. He's displayed God's healing power. He's been healing all those who are sick. And then as he comes to the cross, just as we heard in that poem, his life is right on the edge. They're beating him and taking him to this cross. As they take him, they put nails into his hands and into his feet. He is really dead. And then as he dies, he's taken down from the cross And he's put into a tomb, and a a stone is rolled across the front of that tomb. And that's where our story picks up. His friends and followers are afraid, and they're hiding. And here we are at the last chapter of Mark. Mark 16, starting at verse 1, it says this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This whole series has been called The Way of Jesus, and today it's the way of life. The way of life. You know, we we live in an information overload generation, don't we? Information overload. Um, I mean, we've that's been the case for many generations, actually, but it's got a lot more severe in our time. I was reading some stats earlier this week, which which apparently this is this is the case. The world uses 2.5 quintri- quintillion bytes of information per day. A quintillion is Uh, a number with 18 zeros after it. And the world consumes that amount of information per day. And of course, internet use has a huge contributing factor. Apparently in 2013, there were 2.6 billion internet users in the world. And in 2022, it's 4.6 billion internet users. That is an astonishing rate of growth. Um, Well over 50% of the world are connected to the internet, and the mobile phone is one of the reasons we are consuming data like never before. Your social media feed, every video you've watched before you've come to church this morning, every Instagram post, every little bit of data on the internet, every article that you've read, all of that data is overloading our senses. And, And there are psychologists who are saying we're suffering from fatigue from information overload. I wonder if you've ever felt like that. Have you talked to to people before and they're just saying they're so burnt out, they're so overwhelmed, and you kind of look at their life and they're not really doing very much. They're sort of just doing the average thing, but they're so burnt out. Maybe you felt like this. You feel worn down. Do you know there's a really good spiritual remedy to that? Just put your phone away. I mean, it's 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 sort of a joke, but I've known that in my life. You know, we're consuming data all the time, and we can't sort of sift or filter what is true. And so into that backdrop, I love the simplicity of this information. 
you are looking for Jesus, he has risen. This message begins with information. Information from this person who's an angel sat at the empty tomb. The women come and simply says, you're looking for Jesus, he has risen. That is the information of the gospel right there. If you want to know what it means to be a Christian, it is to understand that Jesus was dead and now he's not. That is the essence of what we believe. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, I would not be stood here. I wouldn't be a Christian. I wouldn't believe any of it. But because he did, everything changes. Everything is different. Nothing is the same. People don't die and then come back, do they? And yet Jesus, we're told here, has done this. And I think it's information in two parts. It's information about the desire of the women. So this angel knew their desire. What does he say? You're looking for Jesus. And this is true today. God knows the desire of your heart. Have you come into this room looking for Jesus? Have you come looking for an answer? I'm guessing that you're here in church this morning for a reason. That you've come, maybe your friends invited you, maybe you come here regularly. But what's inside of you? Well, I want to let you know this morning that God knows your heart. He knew those women's heart. They came looking for Jesus. Have you come looking for him? That's one bit of information he knows. The other bit of information is just simply the truth. He has risen. He has risen. The Bible tells us that Jesus voluntarily gave up his life to forgive the sin of all people. You and I have fallen far from God's standards. and We need a savior. We cannot save ourselves. And the Bible tells us that Jesus comes. He lives a perfect life of love. And then he dies voluntarily. He chooses to go to the cross. No one forced him. He could have walked away. He could have got out of that situation. But he goes to the cross. Why does he do it? To forgive our sins. The punishment that we deserve goes on to Jesus. And in this act, there is justice for all sin, for all the error, for all the mistakes, for all, every time we've missed the mark, everything you've done personally. Not just me, not just you, but all people down through the generations. Every thought, every evil act, every lying word, every lustful look dealt with at the cross. The information is that Jesus comes back after having died. But the real question is, what are you going to do with that information? I had these two friends outside of the city. They grew up in a church but neither of them really understood the information. They had heard it for years and years. And then one day, one of them, he happened to be reading his Bible because someone had encouraged him to do it. And as he read it, it was like the penny dropped and the light went on and the information suddenly took on a new revelation for him. He suddenly understood what Jesus had done. And he was so overwhelmed by this that he went to this other friend of ours. He knocked on his door. He drove around his house, knocked on his door. He said, he didn't even say hello. He just said, do you know what Jesus did for us? And his other friend also went to church, and he said, well, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know. No, no, but do you know what he actually did? He said, well, I, I think I know what he did. And he said, let me, let me come in. So he, he goes in. They sit down at the table. And this friend who's had this revelation, he begins to tell him about Jesus' death on the cross, and that when he died, that everything we've done wrong has been forgiven. And if we just trust in him, we can have eternal life. We can have peace with God. More radical than that, we have a relationship, personal relationship with the one who designed the sun, the one who designed the galaxies. We can know him. And as he spoke, this other friend was like, I, I never actually understood the information. And so both of them, their response around that kitchen table was simply to pray and to put their personal trust in this Jesus. But what's your response this morning? As you hear the information, maybe for some of you, it's the first time you've heard the information that Jesus was dead and now he's alive. And what that proves is that he is exactly who he said he was. Look at what, he, what happens to the women next, though. In verse 6, 
The angels told them the information, and then he says, come and have some investigation. Come and see the place where they laid him. Come and see the place. Maybe you've heard the information, but you need a little bit of investigation this morning. Maybe you kind of are interested, but you don't know all the facts. Well, the angel gives a pretty good way of going about this. Just come and see. Check it out for yourself. Don't just believe this guy stood at the front of church. Go and do the work for yourself. Go and look, as it were, into the empty tomb. Go and see what is there. I can give you some evidence today that you will all agree with. Here's the evidence that you'll all agree with. Death is definite. Death is definite. Dead people live in graves. That is hopefully not new information to you. But Jesus isn't in this grave, is he? Come and see the place where they laid him. I think this is a good principle to follow. That if we've heard the information, we aren't actually called just to make a blind leap of faith. We can go and investigate this information. And that's exactly what these women do. There was an American journalist called Lee Strobel. He was an atheist and he was an award-winning journalist. And then his wife started to go to church and she became a Christian and he was devastated with this. He could not accept the fact that his wife was believing these fairy tales and this nonsense. And as a journalist who was interested in facts and evidence, he set about investigating the, the, the claim of the Bible that Jesus was dead and now he's alive. So he spent months as an investigative journalist looking at the resurrection. He looked at scientific records, at medical records, at historical records, at theological records, all with the aim to disprove and write an article saying that the resurrection is a total farce and a hoax. But after months of doing that, he was overwhelmed with the amount of evidence proving to him that the resurrection can be believed. It's actually been turned into a film called The Case for Christ and a book. You may have read it or seen it. You can watch that on Amazon Prime. It's a really interesting watch. But I wanted to show you, rather than me give you the evidences for the resurrection, here's a video of Lee Strobel just giving you four reasons why the resurrection can be believed. Have a watch of this. I like to look at the evidence for the resurrection in four categories. The first one is, did Jesus die on the cross? Was he dead? Virtually every scholar on planet Earth concedes that Jesus was dead after crucifixion. We have no record of anyone anywhere ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Uh, even the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, published a peer-reviewed scientific medical study of the evidence for the death of Jesus and said clearly the weight of the evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Even the atheist New Testament scholar, Gerd Ludeman, says, historically, it's indisputable that Jesus was dead. So Jesus was dead. The second category of evidence is the early accounts we have for the resurrection. In other words, I used to think as an atheist that the resurrection was a legend, and that took a long time to develop in the ancient world. But what I learned is that we have preserved for us a creed of the earliest Christian church a creed that is a eyewitness-based report of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this creed has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus. Within months. That is historical gold. So we've got a newsflash from ancient history on the resurrection. Third category of evidence is the empty tomb. And the best evidence for that is even the opponents of Jesus implicitly admitted the tomb was empty. Because when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now, they're conceding the tomb's empty. They're just trying to explain how it got empty. So everybody's conceding the tomb was empty. How did it get empty is really the issue. And that goes to the fourth category of evidence, which is eyewitnesses. You know, for most of what we know about ancient history, it comes from one or maybe two sources of information. And yet, for the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources, inside and outside the New Testament, confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the risen Christ. That is an avalanche of historical data. 
So you put all that together, and you have a really good case for Easter. You can look into that for yourself a little bit more. And I would encourage you strongly to investigate the evidence. But this isn't just academic investigation this morning. This is personal investigation. Because what happens if you investigate the evidence and it actually is true? Then what? You're going to have to do something with the information. And I want to encourage you to investigate in your own heart, in your own mind. If this is all true, what does it cost to follow this Jesus? Well, the very first and most important thing to say there is that believing in Jesus, having a faith in Jesus, doesn't cost anything because he won the the victory on the cross. That there isn't some way we can earn it. We can't pay for it with money. It's simply belief in who Jesus is and what he's done. Asking for forgiveness for our sin, turning away from those things that we know are wrong, and coming to him in faith. And whilst that is a free gift of God, actually, if we start to walk that way, it will cost us everything. Everything that you have. Not just a little bit of your life, not just the bits that you want to give to Jesus, but even the bits that you don't want to give to him. It means laying down your rights, laying down your preferences, laying down your pride, laying down everything you hold dear and giving it to him. And here's the kicker in the whole thing. Even laying down your life, if, you, if it came to it. But here's the, here's the really fascinating, wonderful, and my own personal testimony of this, that it is totally worth it. How can it be totally worth it to give up your entire life to follow this guy? Well, if he is exactly who he said he is, then we have nothing to lose by following him. Absolutely nothing. This is not just an investigation of the evidence. It's an investigation of where are you really at? What are you willing to give to follow him? I don't want to sell you fake news today. I want to give you the good news. The good news is that Jesus loves you and has died for you. And as we investigate the truth of that, it will cost us everything. But it is the best decision we could ever make. You have the information, and I'm encouraging you to go and do the investigation. But really, where it all comes to a head is about the invitation that the angel gives. What does he say? But go tell this to the disciples and to Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. He is going ahead of you. It's an invitation to go after him, to follow him him. You know, when someone goes ahead of you, it gives you a bit of confidence, doesn't it? If someone does something first, everyone's sort of standing around and someone does something first, it gives you a bit of confidence that you can do it. I remember some years ago, um, when we were younger, we went with our cousins to America, and we went on this holiday, and there were three uh, guys, my brother, myself, my cousin, and then his sister, and this, um, uh, yeah, our cousin. And we were out at this water park in America having a great time. And there was this huge, huge water slide, like vertical drop style water slide. And we remember looking at that thing, we're going to go on that. And so we all ran up to the top of this thing. It took ages to get there because it was so tall. We got to the top and myself, my brother and uh, our other cousin, he looked over and we all looked over the edge and thought, do you know what? There is absolutely no way we're going to go on this. It was so high. And as we're deliberating over here, suddenly we hear this scream, and it's our, our girl cousin. She's jumped on the slide and gone for it. And we all looked at each other, and we were fighting with each other as to who was going to go next, because she had suddenly gone first. She gave us the confidence to go after her. Well, Jesus has gone ahead. Jesus has gone ahead. What does that mean? Jesus has died and he's come back to life. And for every person who would follow him, we will follow suit. Death is not the end for those of us who know Jesus. Do you know, I genuinely can stand here in front of you today and say, I am not afraid of death. Why? Because Jesus has died and he's risen again. What's the promise? That if we believe in him, that even when this life ends, we don't really die. We live on forever with him. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life. And all of us who follow him will follow that same journey of resurrection. 
He is going ahead of you. It's not just that we follow him. It's that we become more like him. This is an invitation to become more like Jesus. To know his goodness and his love, his compassion and his truth living within you. Whether you're like Lee Strobel, an atheist here this morning, whether you're an agnostic, just kind of okay with the world the way it is, but believing perhaps in the goodness of people, whether you are a Christian and have been so for many years, whether you believe in a different God, here is what Jesus said that cuts through the middle of all of it. And it is up to you whether you believe this or not. It is quite black and white. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, you've got to be a madman to say that unless you're God. And you've got to be a madman to claim that you're going to come back from death unless you're God. It's a very testable thing to claim that you can beat death. And all the evidence points to this reality. And here's the invitation that Jesus is offering. I'm going ahead of you. Will you follow me? Will you follow me? This morning might be the best day of every day to make that decision to follow Jesus. He made an invitation to the disciples at that time, but he makes an invitation to us in Southampton in 2022. And the invitation is, will you follow him? And I wonder, there might be some of you in this room that are ready to say yes. And there might be others of you saying, actually, I need to do a little bit more investigation here. And I would really strongly encourage that. And so in a moment, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And it's a prayer of response to that invitation, basically saying, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. Because whatever stage we're at, we can pray this. But particularly if you have yet to have done this for the first time, make this Easter count. Make it work in that direction that Jesus has given us all the information and encouraged all the investigation, but really it's about what will you do with this invitation. So what I'd love for us to do is take a moment and just stand if you're able and close your eyes, and then I'm going to pray. And perhaps if the prayer team is here this morning, I'd love to encourage them just to come and make their way over to the right, my right over here. And As I pray, I'm going to invite you to pray quietly in your heart the same prayer that I'm praying. This is a response to Jesus. And if you pray it or you feel like you want more prayer, then the guys that are going to be over here to my right in a moment would love to pray with you as we come and sing our final song. So let me just lead us in this prayer. Let's close our eyes together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this good news. We thank you that you are risen from the dead. But Lord, we want to thank you particularly that you went to the cross. That you have forgiven our sin. That because of you, we can have peace with God. Lord, and we have all the information we need. And many of us in this room have investigated these claims and found them to be true. But for every single one of us, Lord, we look to you as you invite us to know you more. To walk with you, to go the way that you are going. Lord, we thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And today... We want to turn away from going our own way, our own direction. And we want to turn towards following you. And we pray, Lord Jesus, not that we would just simply follow you as an academic exercise, but that we might now know the power of the Holy Spirit living within us, empowering us to do what is right, empowering us to love empowering us to be faithful and obedient to you. 
And Lord, I just have this sense as I'm praying that there are many of us who are worried about the sacrifices we have to make in following you. Lord, would you show us how good you really are and how worth it it really is? Whatever surrender we have to bring, whatever sacrifice we have to make, would you show us that you really are the joy of life and that in you we have life. You are life. And that without you, we are as good as dead. So Lord, on this Easter morning, I just want to pray over us here in this room. I pray that you would come, that you would move among us, and that we would respond to your invitation to know you and to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you pray.